Hello friends, Navinat on No Limit Hold'em, as promised for the holiday season, I'm releasing the formula, ready or not, here it comes. Uh, the formula is going to be a series of videos uh, that is really intended to give you an overall strategy uh, specifically designed to beat micro and small stakes, heads up, sit and goes, uh, especially and specifically for Bovada or Ignition, uh, formerly known as Bovada, uh, and what this is uh, going to entail and what I hope it, it captures the feel of is sort of what Super System promised to be, if only by title. So like, when you picked up the book Super System, or you heard of the book Super System for the first time, what did you think it was going to be? Uh, that's what I want this video series to be. I want it to deliver. And you might ask, is it even possible or argue and say that it's not possible to have like a cookie cutter, one size fits all recipe for winning poker. Um, and I would say that uh, you're probably not far off from correct if you say something like that. Um, I absolutely do think you need to think. Uh, you need to uh, be a reactive and proactive player. And I think your game has to be dynamic to be effective. Uh, but I think that you can take uh, a dynamic strategy and you can condense it into something sort of akin to a system and that's the goal here that's what I'm going to try to do and you can be the judge as to whether or not I accomplish that goal so um, cookie cutter yeah kind of um, dynamic yes definitely and really the I guess the the sort of balancing act that I've tried to do with this video series, what's made it a little bit more difficult than I anticipated it being is really just finding the right balance between how dynamic it is and how simple and uh, cookie cutter it is. And definitely those are two poles. Those are two, um, I don't want to say mutually exclusive factors, but they're not on the same, they're, they're definitely not a combo, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it comes down to this, right? Like when I I uh, did the first Run It Up From Nothing series where I cashed my bankroll out. Uh, I had some frequent player points, binked for like $2.59 or $2.89 in a frequent player point tournament and, and rolled that up to 500 cashed it out, started again. If you watched any of that from uh, PokerTube or if you've watched it here on YouTube, um, uh, then you know what I mean. And, and I absolutely did have a system. Uh, but I absolutely also was playing a dynamic strategy, so I knew uh, from you know personal first-hand experience that this is a real thing that can be done. The real question is, can I get it across properly? And again, I'm going to ask that you be the judge of that. And really what the formula is going to entail, and what I hope is going to come across in every video um, that I do on this topic, is this overarching agenda that if you can learn to think like a winning player, you can learn to be a winning player. And if I can present the ideas in a systematic way, it's going to allow you to have kind of a, a starting point, a place of reference, and allow you to win money uh, while you're improving your game. Really what it's going to come down to every step of the way in all of these videos is going to be uh, having good defaults, uh, but figuring out what you know, learning to identify the things that would cause you to want to deviate from your kind of good, uh, solid strategy. So being able to identify the things that would make you want to adjust your strategy, and then knowing how to adjust, like in which direction to go, how to make uh, exploitative adjustments against different types of uh, archetypal or archetypical villains and uh, like maniacs and calling stations, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's the idea here. So the the first the first couple of things that I think every winning poker player's got to get figured out, and maybe what kind of separates somebody who can be probably is a good winning poker player from somebody who's maybe not, is the ability to construct good ranges and the ability to implement good lines. Having good sharp default ranges and good sharp default lines and then understanding how to adjust them. So uh, learning how to frame hands based on relative hand value and your opponent's mistake propensities. 
uh, starting with something objective and translating into something more um, relative, right? Um, so having good, tight default ranges, default lines, crisp lines, uh, understanding kind of the basics and the fundamentals, understanding things like showdown value and value and when you should be going for three streets and when you should be trying to get stacks in and when you should be taking more of a pot control type line. Uh, and then, you know, in general, uh, with a given hand and a given situation on a given flop texture, given run out, uh, and then how that changes based upon the types of mistakes that you expect your opponent to make in that situation or in a given situation. And I think this uh, tool that I came up with, um, Navinad's line, um, is pretty useful. And uh, that's uh, this, this stuff down here. And that goes from left to right. It's uh, nutted value to value to showdown value or bluff catcher uh, to draw to air. And then the polls, this AI, is aggression incentive. So you've got the most incentive to aggress on the polls or at the polls and the least amount of incentive to aggress in the center here is kind of how to read this. Uh, so if you understand that, I mean, and that should be pretty, I think, cut and dried. Um, if you've got a nutted value hand, you want to aggress because you're hoping to get um, called by worse, right? Like, if you've got the nuts, what what is the best use for the nuts? Um, well, the way that you can more, most efficiently use the parts of your range that are nutted value hands is to win the maximum amount of money from the from the top of your opponent's range, and that's what the nuts are good for. Uh, so you have all kinds of aggression incentive at the outer pole on the left, uh, almost regardless of who you're playing against. Note I said almost. <clears throat> uh, then value, of course, uh, it still means that you've got plenty of incentive to bet because you can get called by worse when you've got a, a strong value hand, then often the best way to use that strong value hand is to you know, go for three streets of value, or maybe take like a bat, bat, bat line, given that you're not raised, but planning on bet folding on any given street. But even though you have a value hand that you're planning on betting for three streets, it's important to understand that once you get raised, that changes your relative hand value, uh, because it uh, it changes the range of hands that your opponent's representing. So, nutted value, you've always got incentive to aggress. A hand that's usually going to be uh, considered a value hand you'll usually want to aggress with that also and go for maybe two, three streets. And again, it's important to, um, to understand that once your opponent takes an action that maybe you weren't expecting or didn't account for or just weren't thinking of uh, when you decided what kind of hand you had, your hand changes. So we really look at these uh, relative hand values at each decision point. Uh, so if you've got, you know, nutted value in a given decision point, then you have plenty of incentive to aggress. Uh, or if you have a value hand in any given uh, spot, then you've got plenty of incentive to aggress. Once you're raised, maybe your hand shifts at that decision point uh, because your opponent exercised an option that took your hand from a value hand and turned it into something more like showdown value or a bluff catcher. Now, as you move towards the inside, uh, showdown value bluff catcher. This is where you have uh, the least amount of incentive for aggression and actually in the dead center you'll often have no incentive for aggression. Um, and then we start moving back towards uh, reasons to bet. Like when you have a draw, um, it's often very helpful and useful for you to get your opponent to fold when possible and you've got plenty of equity to back you up. Uh, so you do have incentive to aggress with a draw you have incentive to aggress with air because if you've got air, anything your opponent folds is fantastic for you. So, you know, this is kind of like a basic representation of a pretty pretty simple idea, but of course it's uh, much more complicated than this. And, you know, it's sort of um, this one, two, three, four, five, um, the, these five types of hands. It, it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. I mean, like, what if you have two over cards with three to a straight flush. Uh, do you have a draw? Do you have air? I mean, you know, it's somewhere in between there, really. Um, or what do we call a draw? What's considered a draw exactly? What if we have you know, just a gut shot or like a weak gut shot? Is that a draw? I mean, well, kind of, right? So this, it's ar these are arbitrary distinctions sometimes between nutted value and value. 
or showdown value bluff catchers you, well really the same thing but draw what's what's exactly draw what's air like what if you have just two over cards is that a draw well i mean kind of you're you're drawing the top pair right um so just but i think it's helpful and again we have to try to uh, in, in order for one person to teach another person anything uh you can't just like xerox your brain and stick it in your um student's brain or head rather um and it wouldn't be all that helpful if you could like you know, Xerox every thought that you have. Uh, the idea is to condense information into small packages where there's a lot of information that's maybe a little bit more generalized that can fit in a small little section. You can take that little uh, seed, I guess, and you can then hand that to your uh, student and they can plant it into their brain <clears throat> and then hopefully grow it um, on their own, right? So that's the idea. So we are taking complicated ideas and condensing them into little nuggets, little uh, little poker knowledge seeds. Um, so this is a generalization, and any effective type of teaching is going to be that to some degree, right? Uh, but the generalization is going to be this, that understanding that you're generally playing really basically one of five hands or five types of hands, and you're only going to be up against one of a generalized three different opponents, right? You're either going to have like nutted value, value, showdown value, draw or error, and you're either going to be playing against a player that you expect to make a lot of calling mistakes, a player that you're expecting to make a lot of aggressive mistakes, or an opponent that you expect to be overly compliant, meaning that he's going to play passively or uh, take a lot of check back or check call type lines, right? Uh, knowing the objective value of your hand in any given spot and how it would fair against your opponent's range and where it fits into your overall range and maybe how it would look from a GTO perspective uh, and then understanding how your opponent's tendencies are going to shift the value of your hand in each of these given spots is the key uh, to effective poker and I think definitely it's the key to effective teaching and learning at about this level, you know, where we're trying to really just crush the uh, micro stakes and small stakes. This is the foundation. So, um, and that's going to be true for the entire video series, right? But what's true of this video? What are we going to be talking about in this video? Well, I'm going to give you some guiding, uh, guiding lines, like guiding, guiding ranges. We're going to talk about some default stuff, like uh, default ranges, you know, default range construction. Uh, we're really talking about heads up play. Uh, in this series. We're talking about 75 big blind starting stacks. We're talking about usually a turbo format, but I guess that's really neither here nor there. I guess that isn't much of a strategic implication, really, uh, particularly when you're playing heads up. So strike that comment from the record, please. But, you know, we're talking about my ranges. What ranges do I advocate and which ranges do I use? And uh, really, I use the ranges that I advocate and I advocate the ranges that I use by and large because I record almost everything, almost every game that I play. Uh, it doesn't all make it to, to viewers, um, it doesn't even all make it to uh, any kind of outlet where it could potentially be viewed, but I've got most of my sessions recorded. Um, so yeah, anyway, my, the default ranges uh, that I advocate and the way that I advocate constructing ranges uh, in a strictly default sense, you know, when you're uh, out of position, how do we construct a three bet range? When we're in position, how should we construct our four bet range? Uh, and those are things that translate or transfer. You know, those are things that should be relatively simple to take out of my brain, uh, turn it into a little seed, hand it to you, allow you to stick it into your brain, and then with some watering, hard work. Um, I don't know. I think my analogy is starting to break down, so forget it. But. Um, so we're, then we're going to talk about how to adjust those ranges based on things like uh, the history that you have with your villain, um, any kind of like reads or tells you've picked up on, like well, timing tells, um, bet sizing tells, uh, whatever history you might have. Uh, the stack sizes in a given situation, stack sizes definitely change ranges, uh, especially in, in heads up. Well, I don't, I don't mean that um, it's especially true that stack sizes are going to change what ranges you should use when you're playing heads up sit and goes but I guess I mean that in the sense that you're generally like almost always unless there's uh, a, one of you gets stacked in the first blind round there's going to be uh, well in the first hand I guess stack sizes are going to change 
over the course of any sit and go uh, and heads up sit and go. So it, it is, um, it's always going to be the case that stack sizes are going to change the, the kind of ranges you should use and the bet sizing you should use. But it's, uh, I think it's most important to understand those uh, concepts fully when you're playing heads up sit and goes, uh, especially like turbo heads up sit and goes. Uh, but I digress. So bet sizing, uh, looking at what, what kind of uh, correlation and connections are there going to be between the types of ranges we want to use and the bet sizings that we want to use and the stack sizes that we have, the depth, the SPR that we're going to create or, or not. Um, and our opponent or your your opponent all of those things are connected and they're they're connected in sometimes complex ways uh, and we're going to see about just kind of trying to tease out those connections tease out the information from those connections and see if we uh, if we know a and b are true what does that say about c and you know that's kind of like uh, deductive reasoning and that's a lot of what makes a poker player effective to begin with so i think that if you're a good student and you're good at learning, then it's likely that you're going to be a good poker player. All right. Um, Navinad on No Limit Hold'em. These are like my four things. These are the things that I uh, pound into every student that I've ever had has heard me talk about all four of these things probably at length or at least, I mean, any, any student I've had beyond the first uh, couple lessons has definitely heard me harp on all of these subjects ad, ad nauseum. Uh, framing hands based on relative hand value and your opponent's mistake propensities, number one, right? Um, and that's like going back to Navinad's line where um, your your relative hand value and the way that you want to act on a hand is going to change based on your opponent's mistake propensities, right? Um, efficiency, huge. Like efficiency is everything. I'm convinced now. Uh, if, if you want to get better at life, get better at efficiency. If you want to be more effective, become more efficient. Uh, efficiency is like the same thing as elegance, and elegance is the same thing as beauty, and beauty works. I mean, this is uh, especially true. It's not especially true in poker. It's especially something I want to talk to you about in poker terms because we're doing a video on poker here, but really efficiency is paramount in every aspect, and poker is certainly not an exception. Uh, so when we're talking about efficiency, the things I, I like to, the little uh, light bulbs that I hope to get to go off are going to be uh, waste not, want not, and a place for everything and everything in its place. Uh, this is important when we're thinking about what hands we want to use in what spots. Like when we're constructing ranges, uh, pre-flop or post-flop. Uh, if we're uh, if we have this hand and we're not sure if we should be using it for this range or that range, think about what its inclusion in given range is going to do to your uh, strategy at large, and what effect it's going to have on other ranges when it's. You know, it's in this range, it can't be in that range, and what is that going to look like? So um, understanding that if we, you know, sometimes if we three bet a certain hand, like a hand that uh, splits the gap between your opponent's opening raise size, or I'm sorry, opening raising ranges, and the range of hands he's likely to continue with uh, against a three bet, then we probably shouldn't be three betting it. Uh, an example might be um, in a heads up game, if uh, you're against a completely unknown uh, player, you're in the very first hand, and your opponent opens the uh, the button for a min raise or maybe two and a half times the big blind, and you've got queen ten suited. Um, your hand, you know, probably it's probably going to be ahead of your opponent's range, if only slightly, and if not in objective terms, at least in um, overall like value of hand terms or playability. Um, it, it, the hand has more value than most of the range of hands that your opponent's likely to open for the button. Um, so should you three bet it? Uh, well, probably not, because in doing so, it, it's likely going to turn your hand into a bluff, right? You're, or, or at very least, you're not using your uh, queen ten suited uh, as efficiently as you could. Um, if you're going to only three bet a certain percent of hands, uh, then why use a perfectly good flat calling hand? Um, when you could three bet, maybe even three bet something worse or something that just doesn't play as well um, in its place and keep the same percentages but just have more efficient ranges. Um, this is especially true when we're talking about polarizing our ranges, which won't always be the case when we're out of position against an unknown opponent. It probably actually, as a pure default, should not be the case. But maybe we're looking at four betting our opponent. Maybe we open the button in hand number one facing a three bet and we've got king jack offsuit. 
um, that might be a spot where it makes an awful lot of sense to flat call rather than uh, re-raise and you know never get uh, called by worse and uh, you know not fold out better very often and uh, really it just it, it probably fits better as a call um, so polarization and efficiency go hand in hand and uh, polarization and being in position go hand in hand generally speaking uh, because you're you know usually going to have the advantage of being able to profitably flat call more hands uh, more on that later uh, this, the uh, third and fourth things that I harp on all the time are targeting and bet sizing. You know, if you kind of understand what types of hands your opponent's likely to have, then you should understand if your hand is strong enough to value bet, or if it is weak enough to use as a bluff. Like, if you're bluffing, what hands are you bluffing against? What hands do you expect your opponent to have that are better than your hand? that you would prefer to fold that will indeed fold if you bet. If you don't know, then you need to think it out a little bit further and decide whether you even have a profitable bluffing opportunity in the first place. And bet sizing with purpose. And all of these things go together. Um, that's one thing you'll learn about poker is you start learning and understanding and getting your head around the game space of No Limit Hold'em a little bit better is that all of these different dynamics and all these different uh, uh, things, they really do uh, form this kind of well-knit, interwoven um, network of connectivity. Like everything's kind of related to everything else. Uh, like bet sizing and targeting are, go so hand in hand. And uh, efficiency and sizing. I mean, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about sizing our bets properly. We're talking about sizing our bets efficiently. But what are we betting against? We're betting against some range of hands that we're targeting. And based on the range that we have and where our hand falls in the grand scheme of our, or the overall scheme of our range, um, and how strong or weak our opponent's range is, what hands we have. Uh, to either value target or to bluff target against or to check back to induce or to check and call and induce um, all of that's going to help you to do what? To really just frame your hands based on relative hand values and uh, your opponent's mistake propensities and um, kind of in line with the line on making lines which is down here uh, so again this is the Nut value, value, showdown value, or bluff catcher, draw, error. Um, you're always playing one of these five hands against one of three opponents and understanding um, where your hand typically is going to fit. Like if you're playing against an unknown or a reg or uh, even you could think of it as uh, if you're playing against a perfect GTO robot, uh, what, like where does your hand fall? Uh, given the flop and the uh, ranges you expect your opponent to have and the range that you expect your opponent to expect you to have um, if you have like you know ace queen and a three bat pot and the flop comes out ace nine eight you know what is your hand you know do you have a value hand a nutted value hand is it just showdown value um, do you need to improve but have decent equity in which case you have a draw do um, you have almost no chance of winning the pot? I mean, then you have error. Um, and, you know, to a degree, uh, a lot of these things, just, they, they depend on um, all of the things we've been talking about. They depend on your opponent's mistake propensities, though, um, like first and foremost. And, and stack sizes, depth. You know, if you're uh, playing very deep, then top pair second kicker might not be a hand you want to take to the felt, right? You, you might not want to go broke with that hand if you're playing 400 big blinds deep. Um, if you're in a three bet pot and you started with a 60 big blind effective stack, uh, then probably you can play top pair second kicker as though it's the effective nuts, you know, so then it's shifted more towards nutted value. Um, but what if your opponent's a nit in that case, then you might want to shift it more over to like just value and try to go for like two streets. Um, what if he is a calling station? Well, in that case, then you should play your hand, uh, more like it's the nuts and you should try to get it in. What if your opponent's a maniac? Well, this is the kind of interesting thing. This is the thing I think is the most interesting about this uh, this line that I developed, this chart, this uh, whatever you want to call it, really teaching tool, this aid that I use, um, is that if you're playing against a very aggressive opponent, the effect that that has is actually drawing away from the poles 
towards the center. If you've got a value hand, a hand that you would normally consider like maybe a hand that you're likely to try to bet for two streets of value, but you feel like if you go for three streets against most players, you're going to be basically wasting your hand. You're not going to be playing it efficiently. You're almost going to be turning it into a bluff um, in the sense that if you get your three streets of value, you're probably going to be beat. So if you bet three times and you're beat by all the hands that call you, then there's a sense in which you're bluffing, but you're making a bluff that's not going to work. Um, but people say that, like bluffing with about, uh, well, turning your hand into a bluff, basically. Um, but if you're playing against a maniacal opponent, what's interesting is that it, it turns out that then in those cases, you should play your hands more like their showdown value or bluff catchers. Like if you've got that top pair with a mediocre kicker that you might usually go for two streets with against a good red, uh, then it shifts it to the left and you can play it more like a nutted value hand against a total fish. Uh, or if your opponent is super aggressive, then you play it more like you would, um, you know, the second pair with a weak kicker against most players. You know, play it like a bluff catcher or like showdown value because, you know, you don't want to bet and get raised by this maniac and be put in a tough decision. Uh, and checking and inducing bluffs has an awful lot of value. So, um, yeah, so understanding this line, if not like, you know, if you don't memorize this line and think of it in the terms that I teach it in, then you can, um, you know, you can think of it in other ways, but just understanding that this relationship exists, you know, however you want to frame it in your mind, is fine. However, it works best for you. Um, I think this line is kind of, uh, it's neat. Um, I might be a little bit biased since I, uh, I, I made it up. But uh, moving on, got a lot of stuff to cover, and I know preflop. Preflop strategy discussion can be pretty boring. I'm going to try to keep it fresh. Hopefully, you've got a sense of that already. Um, and I'm going to try to keep moving. Ranges, uh, when we're talking about ranges and we're talking about heads up poker, what are we really talking about? Well, preflop, we're talking about um, you know ranges are, are going to be in position or out of position, obviously. And your in position ranges are going to basically be in 75 big blind stacks or um, you know kind of the biggest effective stacks that you're going to have uh, being 75 big blinds. You're going to have these ranges. You're going to have a range of hands that open folds. <laughs> you're going to have a range of hands that opens for a raise and then folds versus a 3-bet. Uh, you're going to have another range that's going to open raise and then call facing a 3-bet. Uh, then you're also going to have a range of hands that opens and then 4-bets against a 3-bet and then probably stacks off. And then there's some ranges you may have, um, depending on a lot of factors. You might decide to have a, a range of hands that will open raise and then when facing a 3-bet, will 4-bet, but fold to a jam. Uh, you really may or may not have that range, depending on stack sizes, and depending on uh, what you think about your opponent, and really also, depending on how polarized you want your 4-betting range to be, right? Um, if you feel really comfortable that you should be polarizing your 4-bet range, uh, starkly polarizing your 4-bet range, uh, then maybe you're only four betting hands like pocket aces, pocket kings, and maybe queens in some spot for value, and then some bluffs for balance, then you can definitely open, <clears throat> and then four bet facing a three bet, but fold versus a jam. Um, so moving on. When you are out of position, your ranges are going to be different. You're going to have hands that will flat versus an open raise. Uh, you're going to have hands that will um, just fold versus an open range. There are open raise, sorry. And you're going to have a range of hands that's going to 3-bet versus an open raise but fold to a 4-bet. And then you're going to have a range of hands that's going to 3-bet uh, versus an open and shove versus a 4-bet. And I feel like I was missing a range in there somewhere, but <clears throat> it's uh, one of those that may or Oh, uh, it's the 3-bet and then call a 4-bet. Yeah, so if you're deep enough and the bet sizing is small enough and you think you've got the right read on your opponent, Sometimes you'll want to 3-bet some hands that are planning on just calling against a 4-bet, um, and specifically against players that are using a polarized 4-betting range. This can become a, a, a pretty valid strategy, depending on a myriad of topics that we will get to by the end of this. Um, and by this, I mean series, not necessarily this video. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how far we go. Um, so when we're talking about ranges and sizing, um, I mean, really, that's what this all comes down to. You know, that's what I'm, that's the seed. The seed that I want to give you 
is going to be a seed of range construction and bet sizing. Um, for right now, pretty flat, right? These are the fundamentals. This is the big, the big thing. These are the big two. Um, constructing good ranges and knowing how to size your bets. That's what a lot of it comes down to. So what are we talking about when we're talking about uh, pre-flap, uh, heads up, no limit hold them, ranges and bet sizing? Well, when we're in position, uh, open raising ranges and bet sizing are, again, um, so tightly connected and so mutually dependent that it's really impossible to discuss one of them with any depth or in any intelligent way without also talking about the other. Like you can't really have one without the other one. You can't know one without the other one. Um, you can, you know, really it's, it's interesting if you use a solver and uh, you're trying to tease out what the best range is in some given spot. You've kind of got to start with one or the other and work your way inward and figure out like which range, like this range, I should use with this bet size, and um, that gives me this EV. Okay, well what if I tweak one of these things? Well if I change the bet size, then I've got to change the range, and then the EV changes kind of as a result of the overall tweaks that you do to your range and your bet size. Does that make sense? Like, um, a, a good example would be maybe if you're open raising the button in a 6 max game. If you're using a bigger raise size, you should be using a tighter range, and vice versa. Um, so open raising ranges and bet sizing are irre uh, irrevocably connected, um, intertwined, entangled, if you will. Um, and assuming that you're using a min raise, opening about 75 to 80% seems to be a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, I've been playing around with, um, uh, not Poker Stove, but Equilab, and uh, it seems like I'm open raising actually um, a little bit wider than, se like, uh, I thought I was doing something like 75%, but I think I'm opening... Uh, something more like 77%, 76 and a bit, 70, somewhere between, but it's definitely in this ballpark. Um, I, I kind of knew intuitively or felt like I was uh, opening about you know three quarters of the deck, uh, and then I wanted to really kind of figure out exactly what three quarters of the deck looked like, and if that agreed with the ranges that I actually use in practice and have used in my videos, uh, and used to run it up from nothing. Uh, and it turns out that I was using, I think, you know, this about a about a 76, 77 percent range. Um, <clears throat> then out of position, um, you can't. Th this is an important thing. I, I think this is important, and this gets uh, overlooked, and even I think um, uh, talked about erroneously and uh, discussed incorrectly. Um, this idea that you need to defend 50 percent of your range when you're out of position in the big blind versus a button's min raise to stop him from making an auto profit. This is the idea um, of a uh, minimum defense frequency, right? Like that you have to have this 50% um, this range because if we don't defend at least 50%, then we're allowing our opponent to make a profit with any two cards. Well. You can't, you can't do that. Like that's not, that's not correct. Like that's not the right way to think of it, and it's really not going to be the right way to think about it. And any, I mean, that's, it's incomplete, or I mean, yeah, at the at the least, it is a gross oversimplification of the reality. Um, but kind of interestingly, I think it turns out that you probably actually better be defending against a min raise with a range that's at least fifty percent turns out, um, after playing with uh, Equilab a little bit, I'm, I'm defending something like 62-63% uh, against the min raise. So, um, but it's not necessarily because it's stopping my opponent from auto profit. Because the reality is uh, kind of twofold here. Number one, against a perfect opponent, you can't stop them from making money when they're on the button. Or you could even say, if you were playing against yourself or somebody who's equally skilled, you're not going to be able to stop them from making money on the button because the button is a superior position. You can't make them break. You know, the GTO, if you were both perfectly playing um, like GTO n robot ninjas, um, you're still you're going to lose money out of the big blind. So you can't set it up as your uh, starting point that you want to stop your opponent from making money with his range because he's going to make money with his range. Uh, however, 
it, I do think that it, it happens to accidentally be the case that this is pretty correct, the statement that you've got to defend with at least 50% of your range against a min raise. Um, and maybe it's pretty close to correct, you know, actually. Like 50 and a bit percent against like somebody who's really, really good, a very competent opponent. Um, but most of the time, the range that I'm using is, is wider than that because not only do we not have, I mean, we on one end of it, we can't stop our opponent from auto profiting, so we can't really think of that or use that as our rationale for the, the number of hands that we ought to be defending with. Um, but against a bad player, I think in heads up poker, you can absolutely have, um, I, I know what the micro stakes, this is true. I, I mean, I know it for a fact. I've, I've done this. Um, you can definitely win money from the big blind with the micro stakes. So if you're, if you're better than your opponent by enough of a degree, you can overcome the positional edge. I mean, your opponent's got to be pretty bad or you've got to be pretty damn good or you've just really got to have a good understanding of your opponent's game. Once you know their ranges and understand the lines they take, you, you can win money out of the big blind. So stopping your opponent from auto-profiting isn't exactly the goal at that point either. At that point, you're actually trying to make money. And I think I think you can make money from the big blind and heads up poker at the small stakes games. And I know uh, because I had tracking software before I uh, started playing, before pre-Black Friday, um, when I played a lot of heads up poker at higher stakes, um, for a while, it, well, I started at the micros and grinded it up. And... Um, so I know for a fact that at certain stakes, um, I had a positive uh, EV from the big blind. Now this is going back a long time ago, and uh, the games have gotten tougher, but uh, definitely it's possible um, it, as long as you have a good enough uh, edge over your opponent. That edge can either be because you're better than your opponent is, or, or it can be that you maybe aren't necessarily better um, in a vacuum, but that you just happen to understand your opponent's game or have a strategy that just matches up poorly for your opponent's strategy, like better for you, more poor, like bad for him, um, then you can make money from the big blind. And the other thing is, even when you're going post-flop, uh, that minimum defense frequency is not going to hold uh, because there's spots where you have a range advantage and you're supposed to win money. Or there's spots where your opponent has such a range advantage that you have to check and fold with your entire range. And trying to stop him from auto-profiting would be like setting money on fire. So we're not going to use that minimum defense frequency. But I do think it just happens to be the case that if you're not defending at least 50%, even against really good players from the big blind against a min raise, then um, you're playing too tight. Uh, so open sizes, uh, this is a subject of debate. And I don't really have a place where I firmly uh, come down on this. I I'm not really convinced that there... First of all, there's no consensus, right? Like, different players say different things. And uh, people use um, similar mathematics to come to completely different conclusions on this topic, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about more as we move through the material. Um, so, like, what sizing should we use? You know, you can come in for a min-raise. You can use three times the big blind. Uh, I think we already talked about the fact that, uh, at least from a GTO type perspective, when you're talking in game theory terms, um, you can you can open more hands if you use a smaller size. Um, which I mean, it kind of sounds obvious, but then when you look at it a little bit deeper, the part of it that was obvious turns out to not be the case. But it still is the case that uh, if you're using a smaller size, you can use a larger range, uh, like a, a wider range. And if you're using a larger sizing, uh, you want to, or, or really can, or should, or have to, all these things really mean the same thing in game theory, uh, from a game theory perspective. You can, you have to, you ought to, you should. Um, use a tighter range with when you're using a larger uh, raising size, or, or opening size, or three betting size, or whatever the case may be. Um, so how do we decide? You know, I think, first of all, whatever you're comfortable with is probably fine. Um, but I settled on the min raise uh, for, for myself. Now there's times when I've changed and I've experimented and I've played around. Um, and I'm going to justify my stance and my position. But I told you that I was going to show you the uh, strategy or the system that I personally used uh, to run it up from nothing. And part of that strategy was min raising a pretty wide range. Like 70, uh, like we said, 76 to 77, maybe 78% of hands uh, coming in for a 
two times the big blind open race. Um, so, is that right? Is that correct? Um, again, I, I don't. I don't know that there is a, uh, a a true right and wrong on this. There's pros and cons, and they seem to really be, um, in a lot of ways, equal and opposite pros and cons. I mean, it, it really actually seems to me, intuitively, that multiple raise sizes uh, could be uh, just as good. Like that, um, maybe there isn't even an answer to the question, what is the best open race size? And um, probably, I would guess that in a perfectly GTO strategy, you'd be using like almost every legal race size you have, or a ton of different race sizings. And if you had to pick one size or another, I don't know if you could. You know, I think you could probably, if you if you were using a solver and you're putting tons of time, effort, energy into this, and you're just trying to come up with, you know, some objective measure of what is the best open race sizing to use, um, even from a purely GTO perspective, at 75 big blinds, it's a difficult problem. It's very complex. There's tons of branches on this decision tree. Um, I think, though, what you'd find is wherever you could get the most EV um, would either be almost identical for a variety of bet sizes. When you're maxing out your EV, you could get to that exact top EV with multiple open raise sizes but with ranges that are adjusted appropriately for the open size that you're using, um, or the difference between the perfect bet sizing, and like let's say the perfect raise size turns out to be two and a half times the big blind, I bet you that if you adjusted your range at 3x, or you adjust your range at 2x, and I'd even say if it turns out that the perfect size where you can get the maximum EV uh, using the right range uh, and the right open raising size, all things considered, is three times the big blind. If that turns out to be the truth, I bet you the opening for a min raise with a correctly adjusted open raising range would be a very minute and negligible difference, if there's any at all. Um, I, I find that you can change things on both sides of the equation and they tend to balance out pretty well. Uh, for for you to kind of get your head around this, I think I can. I think I, I just thought of a way that you might be able to understand this. Uh, there used to be some controversy uh, between whether or not we should vary our open race sizes based on position at full ring or um, even at six max. Uh, but let's use the full ring example. There were multiple schools of thought now. When I first started playing poker seriously, um, we were using a standard three times the big blind raise size from all positions and just adding one big blind per open limper that came in before us. Um, and I still do use that uh, very often. Uh, but then a school of thought came out that said, you know, we should actually be open raising smaller from early position and bigger from late position. And then there was a school of thought that came out that was the opposite of that, that we should open raise bigger from early position and smaller from late position. And that school of thought still seems to be um, kind of the closest to a consensus reality there is in the poker universe. Um, I think a lot of uh, like high-level poker players, um, if they don't think that that is the actual best strategy, they're at the very least so used to using it that, and don't see any uh, reason to change it that you'll see it uh, practiced very commonly among very good players. Um, I mean, at least that was the case, you know, months ago. And I, and I would, I would, I would say it's almost certainly still the case. <clears throat> I don't play uh, a lot of full ring, uh, and I don't play. I mean, I do live, but I don't play a lot of full ring uh, online anymore. And when I do, I don't play high stakes. So. Um, hard to say for sure, but I would venture a guess that it's still the case. But here, here's the point. Okay, this is what I was getting at: is uh, what was the argument for open raising smaller from under the gun and bigger from the button? 
Okay, so it, that, that's the two extremes, right? And the school of thought that said open bigger and late position and smaller and early position basically came down to this. They said, well, our range is going to be the strongest when we're in early when we're under the gun. That's when we're going to be opening the strongest range. And if we're opening the strongest range, then we don't want to chase players out of the pot. And we want to offer the big blind a good price to call us when we've got a hand like pocket aces, pocket kings, queens, uh, even ace king. That's when we most want to be called by the big blind. And so we should, or really anybody for that matter, is when our range is the strongest. Um, also, we're out of position. Um, so, number one, you know, just wanting to keep worse hands in when we have the strongest range seems to make some sense. Number two, when we're out of position, we don't want to bloat the pot beyond what is necessary. And open raising for uh, the minimum does the best job of allowing your opponents to fold, uh, possibly isolating you with uh, the big blind, and giving him a price that's compelling, you know, and uh, uh, giving him incentive to make a bad call with a hand that he should not call with, right? Um, and it was also argued. Um, and these, to me, are effective arguments. This sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Um, it was also argued that because you're opening uh, from under the gun, you're already showing so much strength by opening from under the gun that you don't need to put three or four big blinds out there to create fold equity, right? Because you're already using such a strong... Like, opening from under the gun already implies such a strong uh, range that it creates its own fold equity. Just just because you open from a position where you don't expect the uh, open raise to get through very often, right? Um, so all of that seems right. You know, that seems like it makes a lot of sense. So what was the other argument? What was the contrary argument? What was the, uh, um, the opposite? What was its antithesis? Um, well, the opposite argument was we should be opening um, for, for like four times the big blind from under the gun and only coming in for a min raise on the button, the exact opposite. Why? Well, if we're under the gun, we've got the strongest range, and we have the strongest range, we want to get the biggest pot. We want to have the most value created with our raises. So we may as well go four times the big blind and get the maximum amount, amount of value possible. We're not going to be bluffing very often, so we don't need to worry about giving ourselves a good price on a bluff, and we want to get more money in the pot when we've got the strongest range. Um, Okay, so that seems to make sense also, right? So how can both those things make sense? Oh, and the other arguments for open raising bigger from early position and smaller from later position would be when we're opening from late position, we're going to have more steals and we want to give ourselves a better price on our steals. Um, and if we're opening from early position for four times the big blind, uh, that's kind of good because it creates, on average, it's going to create a smaller stack to pot ratio, like if you get three bet and then you four bet and get called, or if you get three bet and you flat, or even just opening four times the big blind and getting called creates a smaller stack to pot ratio uh, than if you had opened some smaller size. So opening for uh, a bigger size uh, also creates more fold equity, and you're out of position, so you want to limit the number of flops you take out of position, obviously, because you're in a, a bad spot. You're out of position. So you prefer to, cur to, to create the additional fold equity of coming in for the larger raise size. Uh, it creates a more favorable stack to pot ratio for the range of hands that you're going to be playing, which is you know, typically going to do better with a smaller stack to pot ratio. Um, it discourages multi-way action. And then if you're uh, opening from uh, the button and you're using a min raise, uh, then you're going to get the most action, but that's fine because you're in position and you want to give your opponent a good price to call you when you're in position. And are you starting to hear and understand this is just pure rhetoric, that none of it makes sense? It's, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. This is baloney. And if you hear somebody saying this on a training video, it, just understand that this is a falsehood. This is a, it's a magic trick, right? Like this is a mental magic trick. Somebody is fooling you. If they, if they get you to believe either one of those, um, the schools of thought are exactly opposite for the exact reason that there is a, an inverse relationship between, um, well, there, no, there's, yeah, well, we'll just say that there is a strong correlation between how big you open raise, like how, what sizing you choose, and how often you will likely get called. The larger you make your raise size, the more fold equity you have, 
Uh, the more full deck when you have, the stronger your opponent's range is that continues against you. Um, being out of position, uh, you, you know, it's like all of those things individually that are said are true, but each one of them has a corollary that I believe actually cancels it out exactly. So I would bet that when poker is eventually solved for like 100 big blind stacks, uh, that they'll find out that the place that you make your adjustments is going to be inside the ranges by position, not range and bet size for opening. Uh, I bet you it turns out that opening one size from every position is the right way to go, uh, or that using different bet sizes um, depending on hands, like the actual, like having like multiple bet sizes from each position, but I don't think it makes sense to vary your bet size by position. I think that is just smoke and mirrors. Um, and the same, for the same reason, um, I don't think somebody can honestly say that they should use this size or that size, or that you should use this size or that size to open raise from the button. It's like still to this day you will hear almost every player that, that seems legit and thinks they're legit, every coach say that you should three bet with a larger size and when you're out of position because you're out of position and you want to create more fold equity. And that's so crazy because it's like, yeah, you do create more fold equity when you use a bigger sizing when you like say three bet from uh, the big blind facing a button open. You, you go bigger and it creates a uh, more fold equity but you also burn more money when you get called by a better hand. So you're, you're putting, when you get called, you're putting in more money out of position. So you're in a bad spot and you built a bigger pot and that wasn't the goal, right? Um, but at the same time, if you have a value hand, then that's good. You got called. You wanted to get called, right? So what this really comes down to is when you're at the top of your range, um, then you would like to have used the bigger size, right? Because... Um, when you get called, that's, well, when you're at the top of your range and you get called, you'd like to have used the bigger size. When you're at the bottom of your range, you'd like it if your opponent folded. And if you use a bigger sizing, your opponent will fold more often. But when he calls, it hurts you worse. So these are just inverses. It's just equal and opposite. It's just like a, a plus and a minus, and I think an exact equal measure. All of that being said, I settled on the min raise because there's got to be, we've got to do something, right? We've got to raise to some size. Um, if I had it to do all over again, I'm not sure I would, um, but I've become so used to this strategy. That's what I landed on. I'm sure it's not bad. And I'm going to go through, because uh, I think this is really important. I think it's a big deal, um, if you haven't figured that out yet, uh, that we get this right or that we at least do something that makes sense. So I'm going to lead you through uh, the reasoning that I use to figure out the uh, open sizing that I think is best, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, really I think it comes down to these three things and then some other minor things. So the three things are gonna be the price that we get on a steal and the value we get from a bluff. Keeping in mind, there's a reverse correlation. Um, like the smaller we make our sizing, uh, the less often it's gotta get through for our bluff to be profitable, but the less money we make when we get called with the value hand. And uh, basic bet theory says the larger I bet, the more folds I get, but the more folds I get, the stronger the range that continues against me. It's all balancing out, right? Um, so then what else can we look at? What sizings are we expecting to, 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 to generate the most mistakes? Like, what do we think our opponent's gonna play worst against? And, and this is why I think I may um, have done something different. Uh, had, had I, if I had it to do all over again, um, I think maybe some players will play worse against three uh, three axing. Now, still, I think as a pure default, playing against uh, just an unknown player, min raising makes a lot of sense because I think players do make an awful lot of mistakes against min races, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then also, how does the stack math work out? So what I mean by that is like when there's a raise, a three bet, a four bet, so on and so forth. Um, like who gets to put the last bet in, or um, are you going to be able to make a, a good four bet? with a good uh, positive return on investment and then be able to fold? Like, are you going to be able to basically open a four bet bluffing range and fold to a jam or not? And, you know, that comes down to the sizing that you start with because these things build up um, and extrapolate. When you're looking at uh, pot geometry, 
uh, it grows um, exponentially, right? Um, and then there's some other minor considerations, but those are the main things. <clears throat> so uh, price on a steel versus value from worse hands. The larger we raise, the more folds we need from our bluffs, but the more folds we will likely get from our opponent, and the more value we're going to get from our strong hands, we have a strong hand to get called, but the less often we're going to get called, uh, so we're going to get that value less often, so blah, 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 blah. I don't think any of that matters. Um, I think it's all new. You know, it all balances out. Um, so what should, what should we look for? Well, instead, I think we ought to look for inflection points, elasticity, uh, and villain's calliness compared to his raisey foldiness. Um, if our opponent is, uh, maybe we can find a raise size. Like maybe he's calling with almost any two cards against the min raise, but he's folding like, you know, half the deck against the min plus range, or raise rather. Or maybe we find that he's calling the exact same range of hands no matter how big we bet. Um, or maybe he's folding a lot more hands if we go a little bit bigger. So we need to look at and look for elasticity. Is our opponent going to call us um, with approximately the same range of hands, whether we open for a min raise, a two and a half times the big blind raise, or a three X open? And if so, well, what does that mean? You know, um, well, it might mean that we can open raise smaller with a range of hands that is on average weaker and we can open raise larger with a stronger range. And we can maybe balance it just enough that our opponent doesn't notice or can't figure it out. Um, especially if he's not running a HUD, especially if you're playing on ignition. Um, so this is what I mean when I say I would do things differently if I were doing it over. If I was doing it over today, maybe I will start it again today for, well, or, for, or like as a New Year's resolution. And I'll start it uh, just max exploitative. Um, that's how I try it. I would try to find inflection points. I would try to find in each opponent, um, is there a spot I can get to that gives me the most fold equity for the least risk? And then I would do that with my light hands, right? With my weaker, the weaker parts of my range. Um, another way to think about it is if we find major elasticity where he's just very sensitive um, to small adjustments to our sizing, then we can even use that to take advantage of him uh, by constructing our ranges not even so much based on the overall strength of our hand but just how it plays best maybe we can open raise smaller with hands like um, ace two suited jack ten nine eight suited seven six suited pocket twos um, and we can go bigger with hands like king ten offsuit king jack offsuit ace eight offsuit um, you know just like the hands that play better with a smaller stack to pot ratio we can use the larger sizing with and uh, the uh, open raising size that, uh, or I'm sorry, the range of hands that we'd prefer to have a lot more money behind, like uh, suited connectors, pocket pairs, maybe uh, our weaker ASAC suited, maybe we use the min raise sizing for those, um, and then just balance as needed. So, um, you know, I think that for me, a min raise is better than sticking to any other single raise size, but I think there could be a lot of value in using uh, variable bet sizing based on our opponent. Um, and the, the list, like the reason I listed the, the villain's calliness compared to his raisy foldiness <laughs> is because uh, the more often our opponent calls us, or really I should say, the more often our opponent raises, uh, the more important it becomes that we get this bat sizing thing right. Um, if he's just going to call or fold, then we've got some wiggle room, guys, you know? Um, but if he's going to be pretty raisy foldy, that's a different scenario. Um, and I'm, I've already kind of spelled that out in a later slide, so uh, right here. So for instance, this is what I refer to as stack math, okay? Um, if we open raise for a min raise, so let's say that we're playing against our, an opponent who's very raise or fold, or he just has a really high three bet percent. Um, if we open for two times the big blind and our opponent three bets us, uh, and then we four bet, we can still fold to a jam, right? But if we raise to three times the big blind and our opponent uses like a standard three times, you know, he's going to pot it or go three X. Um, if he goes three times our open size for his three bet, and then we still want to lay him a bad price on a four bet so he can't just call with anything, um, then we can't fold if he jams on us. You know, like if he, if we open for three times the big blind and he three X's it and we three X that, you know, he, we open for pot, he pots it, we pot it. We're stuck.